Well, as we turn to the Word of God, I would invite you to turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 for this message entitled, Prescriptions for Perilous Times. Our text for this morning is Philippians 4, 4 through 9, which contains some of the most familiar commands in the New Testament. You know, we began this letter last June, and believe it or not, it is my purpose to finish uh, preaching through this letter two weeks from now, the Sunday after Resurrection Day. And then after that, Pastor Allen and Pastor Dave will be preaching for a few weeks, and then we'll come back in late May or so to start a series called Behold Your God, where we're going to walk through a number of passages throughout the Scripture, primarily throughout the Old Testament, and see how God reveals Himself in powerful ways. So we can look forward to that. I know I'm looking forward to that. Well, when you're there at Philippians 4, follow along as I read verses 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your spirit, gentle spirit, be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence... And if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. There are a few problems more common to mankind than the problem of anxiety. In fact, some would say that anxiety is the most common problem among mankind. It's been said that anxiety is our body's way of telling us that something is not right. Well, in a sin-cursed world where nothing is as it ought to be, it's remarkable that we aren't more anxious than we already are. Lost sleep, racing thoughts, endless internal what-ifs monologues, high blood pressure, tense muscles, chest pain, and Many more are the common symptoms of anxiety, ranging from annoying to debilitating. The people in Philippi, to whom Paul writes, are no different than us. They experienced anxiety just like we do. They had conflicts and pressures and dangers and uncertain futures just like us. And you might even say perhaps more because they didn't have all of the conveniences and prosperity that we have today. No doubt, conflicts in the church made some of them hesitant to gather together with the saints because gathering together brought uh, anxiety. It was discouraging more than it was encouraging. Pressures from outside the church made some of the believers hesitant to publicly associate themselves with Christ because of the social consequences Whether there were problems within families or the church or beyond, anxiety is a common experience among believers throughout all ages. What anxious people desperately want, what we need is peace. And peace is more than just harmonious relationships where there are no conflicts. Peace is a condition of the soul where there is tranquility, freedom from undue concern, and stability and confidence. And this passage tells us that peace is possible. More than that, not only can we experience peace, but we can experience the very God who is the source of peace. Now, most of us have heard the instructions in these passages many times before. Perhaps many of you have used the instructions in these passages as you've been giving counsel to others. Sadly, many today look at this passage and think of it as cliche, trite, 
simplistic, unnuanced, and ultimately unhelpful for the problem of anxiety. Believe it or not, there are many believing or many professing Christians today who have embraced the world's view of anxiety and anxiety disorders such that they believe the Bible really doesn't have all that much to say and to contribute to our understanding of and solutions for anxiety. But as one pastor put it, if the Bible is not about anxiety, I don't know what the Bible's about. In that context of which he was speaking, he didn't mean, of course, that anxiety is the primary message of the Bible, but rather that the primary message of the Bible is the gospel of peace. Namely, that God has reconciled himself to sinners through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this gospel of peace resolves the greatest conflict, the greatest fear that mankind has. The fear of death. Beyond that, when we receive and believe in this gospel of peace, we now have access to a wealth of wisdom and truth that helps us understand and respond to the troubles of life that produce anxiety in our souls. And so the Bible does indeed have a lot to say about the causes and the cures of anxiety, far more than we have time for today. Now, I recognize that anxiety can be a complex experience because maladies in the body can indeed contribute to or even just right out cause anxiety. So please hear this. Whatever nuances or complicating factors are involved in in any individual's experience of anxiety none of those things should lead us to set aside God's Word on the matter. Instead, we should start with God's Word and apply God's Word while we're dealing with those complicating factors, physiological or otherwise. Too often, people receive a diagnosis, or perhaps they diagnose themselves, and then conclude that because a label has been attached to their troubles, the Word of God no longer applies to them. That happens with anxiety, with depression, addictions, anger, hyperactivity, and many other challenges and struggles that people face. But beloved, what, whatever is true or theorized about our problems, God's Word still has something to say about our problems. God never promises to remove all of our troubles, but He does give us the truth that we need to glorify Him in the midst of our troubles. And so my appeal to all of us is this, that as we walk through this passage, don't think that this only applies to small problems. Don't think that this is for the ordinary, everyday troubles of life. But if you have big problems... Or if you've been diagnosed with a disorder of some kind, this doesn't apply. No, no, no. This passage does not give simplistic, unsophisticated solution to anxiety. Rather, this passage gives us a prescription for how to respond to any trouble in life in a way that results in experiencing God's peace and God's presence. And so, in perilous times, we find here five prescriptions we must follow to experience peace. Five prescriptions we must follow to experience peace. Let me give them to you up front, and then we'll walk through them one by one. Prescription number one is let joy reign in your heart. Let joy reign in your heart. Prescription number two is let others experience your gentleness. Let others experience your gentleness. Number three, let God take your burdens. Prescription number three is let God take your burdens. Prescription number four is let truth reign in your mind, or let truth rule your mind. And then prescription number five, let truth rule your life. Let truth rule your life. Let's begin with prescription number one, let joy reign in your heart. Look again at verse four. 
Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Throughout this letter, we've seen that the theme of Philippians is, say it with me if you remember, rejoice. To live is Christ and to die is gain. Good job. Here, Paul punctuates that theme not only by repeating the command to rejoice twice, but by expanding the scope of the command to the entire life of the believer. As we've seen Paul talk about joy and rejoicing, he's talked about it in particular circumstances along in the context of of what he's been saying. But here, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. At all times, in all situations, in the morning and at night and throughout the day, in the good times and in the bad times, when when you're happy and when you're sad, when you're celebrating and when you're grieving, when life is given and when life is taken, when there is abundance and when there is need, when there is justice and when there's injustice, in any and every circumstance in life, we are to rejoice. Now, it would be a shallow and wrong understanding of what Paul is commanding here if we were to say or understand Paul to be saying, don't worry, be happy, laugh, giggle, celebrate, throw a party all the time. That's not what it means to rejoice in the Lord. To understand what it means to rejoice in the Lord, we have to remember the definition of joy that we've been using throughout this series. And that is that joy is the emotion of delight or strength produced by the Holy Spirit when we look at the circumstances of life through the lens of God's Word. Our emotions are the reaction of our soul and our body when we think, when what we think and believe and value and desire meet the circumstances of life. So, when we embrace the thoughts and beliefs and values and desires of God, when we, in other words, view life through the lens of God's Word, the Spirit will produce in us a rush of energy that in some situations leads to smiles and laughter. And in other situations, that energy empowers us to confidently endure trials and difficulty. Again, joy is the emotion of delight or strength produced by the Holy Spirit when we look at the circumstances of life through the lens of God's Word. And so, the command to rejoice then is is not a command to feel a certain way, but to think and to respond a certain way. To rejoice is to purposefully change the lens through which we look at life and then respond to our circumstances by faith. We have to remove that that narrow lens and exchange it for the wide-angle lens of God's sovereign and transcendent and eternal perspective. Looking at life through our own lens is like wearing the the wrong prescription. It will give you a headache. But when you take off that wrong prescription and you put on the right prescription... The headache doesn't disappear instantaneously, but eventually the nerves settle down and the pain begins to dissipate. In the same way, looking at life through the lens of God's Word is not a quick fix to anxiety, but it will put us on the path to peace and joy. Now, why is that? Because the ultimate cause of anxiety and other emotional struggles is not thinking the way that God would have us think. The ultimate cause is not thinking the way that God would have us to think. Whatever other factors and complications are involved, whatever might be making it difficult for us to think rightly, it is wrong thinking that produces undesirable emotions. Think about it this way. Is God ever depressed? Is God ever anxious? No. Well, why is that? It's because God knows everything. And He knows that everything will work out according to His 
good purpose. He knows that while there is much evil and wickedness in the world, and while suffering is part of his plan, it is all moving toward a glorious future for those who trust in him and toward a disastrous end to those who rebel against him. So God has nothing to worry about. God has nothing to be anxious about. He wins. His plans are certain. Now the problem is, the bad news is, you and I don't know everything that God knows. The good news is, we know that God knows everything and that He is in complete control. And if God isn't depressed or anxious, then we shouldn't be either. We can trust His knowledge even if we don't have it ourselves. We can trust He is in sovereign control even if we have lost control. Isaiah 26, 3 and 4 says, The steadfast of mind you will keep in perfect peace because He trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for in God the Lord we have an everlasting rock. So we can trust the Lord knowing that He is sovereign, He knows all things, He is in control, and He is working all things for good as we learned last week. But there's good news still. God didn't just leave us in the dark just to say, trust me, because I said so. Just trust me. Consider how the following passages call us to, to rejoice even in the midst of troubles. James chapter 1, verses 2, 2 to 4 says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect results, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So we can rejoice in trials because the effect of those trials will be to grow and mature us in Christ. Or 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 to 7. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we can rejoice in trials because as we endure them, the genuineness of our faith is being tested and strengthened, and as a result, we will be rewarded when Christ returns. Or consider Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. These believers associated themselves with the other believers who had been in prison, and that resulted in the loss of their property, a trial that they joyfully endured because they knew that this world was not their home. They were looking to a, an everlasting and a glorious future. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 11 to 12, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice, he says, and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we can rejoice when we are persecuted for the sake of Christ because that puts us in a long line of faithful men and women who were treated in the same way. These truths help us to rejoice in troubled times, and there are many more in the Scripture. Well, what about the good times? Well, it's easy to rejoice in good times, isn't it? But do you know that we often rejoice in the wrong things in good times? In Luke chapter 10, for example, Jesus sent out the 70 disciples to, to proclaim the gospel in various cities. And they came back rejoicing, it says, saying to Jesus, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. They were all excited because God's power was flowing through them and they were seeing miracles happen right in front of them as a result of their faithfulness. But Jesus said to them, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. 
His point was that our salvation is a greater reality worth celebration than how God works through us in this life. You know, how easy is it for us to take our salvation for granted? And then we look for joy in other things. And then when we can't find joy in other things, we lament as if there's nothing to be joyful about. But beloved, we have been saved from the wrath of God. There is no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All of our sins have been washed away by the blood of Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us. So no matter what else is going on in your life, you can rejoice in the Lord always because you've been set free from the power and the penalty of sin and one day you will be set free from the presence of sin. You can rejoice because you've been reconciled to God whose endless love and mercy is at work in your life every moment of every day. We have boundless hope and infinite reasons to celebrate the goodness and faithfulness of God. H.B. Charles Jr., a pastor in Florida, described worry and anxiety this way. He said, it forgets the past goodness of God and questions the faithfulness of God on the basis of things that haven't happened yet. Well, how can you overcome that mindset? by purposefully looking at your trials and your triumphs through the lens of God's Word, where we will be reminded of God's goodness and faithfulness. That's how we rejoice in the Lord always. So, let joy reign in your heart. Prescription number two, let others experience your gentleness. Prescription number two is let others experience your gentleness. Look at verse 5. Paul says, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. At first, this might seem oddly placed here if Paul is intent on giving a series of prescriptions for how to navigate the troubles of life. Why, Why would he include this command to let your gentle spirit be made known to, to others? Well, not every translation uses the word gentle here. Some of your translations say reasonableness or moderation or graciousness. So the meaning of the word is not necessarily handling someone delicately, but rather it's a disposition that we should have toward others. Listen to this helpful explanation of the Greek word from a theological dictionary. Apiakes, together with its derivatives, was originally an expression for the balanced, intelligent, decent outlook in contrast to licentiousness. Then it was used for a considerate, thoughtful attitude in legal relationships, which was prepared to mitigate the rigors of justice with its laws and claims, in contrast to the attitude which demands that rights, including one's own, should be upheld at all costs. Both concepts, it goes on, are opposed to unbridled anger, harshness, brutality, and self-expression. They represent character traits of the noble-minded, the wise man who remains meek in the face of insults, the judge who is lenient in judgment, and the king who is kind in his rule." Hence, they often appear in pictures of the ideal ruler and in eulogies of men in high positions. Well, there's no more ideal ruler than the Lord Jesus Christ, who himself was gentle and lowly in heart. Jesus himself was meek in the face of insults, and while his judgments are always just, he is gracious toward sinners. This is the opposite to how our flesh tends to respond in times of trouble, isn't it? We tend to be harsh in our responses, demeaning in our words, malicious in our hearts, irrational in our thinking. 
our tendency is to defend ourselves, to shift the blame, to repay evil for evil, feeling justified because of what's happened to us. We respond this way to those who are closest to us, and we respond this way to those that we would consider our enemies. Social media has made every day open season for responding to those we disagree with in unloving and unhelpful ways. Now, maybe you're more righteous than I, but it is so easy to think and speak in ways that are ungodly and not gentle when you can't see the other person except through their words. But here in Philippians 4, 5, Paul calls us to be like our Savior by being gentle with all men, all people. Those who live in our homes, as well as those who we engage with through words on a screen. I mean, how amazing would it be if after a tense conversation, the other person walked away and said, I I still disagree with that person, but man, that was a really good conversation. In Ephesians 4.31, we read, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So rather than letting others experience our wrath and our anger and our bitterness, we're called to let them experience our gentleness and our kindness because that's what we've received from God Himself. Now, why should we do this? Paul says there at the end of verse 5, the Lord is near. Though not grammatically connected to the command to be gentle, it's logically connected in Paul's flow of thought. It's possible that Paul means by this that the Lord is, His presence is near to us, but it's more likely that he refers to the soon return of Christ. And if that's the case, what does the near return of Christ have to do with how we treat one another? Well, let me ask you this. If you knew that Christ was going to come tomorrow, how would you treat other people? It's possible that in saying these things, combining gentleness with the return of Christ, Paul has in mind the parable that Jesus told in Luke chapter 12, where Jesus said, "'Who then is the faithful and sensible steward?' whom his master will put in charge of his servants to give them their rations at the proper time. Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that slave says in his heart, my master will be coming in a long time, and begins to beat the slaves, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk, The master of that slave will come at a day when he does not expect him and at an hour that he does not know and he will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes. The main thrust of that passage is a warning Don't let the perception that Christ's return is far away tempt you to live in sin today. And it's interesting that Jesus particularly emphasizes the beating of fellow slaves, both men and women. Life experience tells us that if you get a group of children in a room together and all of the adults leave... The restraints that hold back sin are loosened, (laughs) to say the least. Well, adults are no different. Again, how differently would we speak and act toward one another if we knew that Jesus could walk in the room at any time? And so, the soon return of Christ should motivate us toward loving one another. In 2 Peter 3, when he writes about the end of the world, Peter says, Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by Him in peace, 
spotless and blameless. Remembering that Christ can come at any moment certainly keeps our sin in check, but it's also a reminder that the judge of all the earth will one day set all things right. And so instead of repaying evil for evil, we can maintain a gentle and kind disposition toward others and even do good to them, knowing that the Lord will address sins and wrongs in His way and at His time. So believer, beloved, let others experience your gentleness. Prescription number three, let God take your burdens. Let God take your burdens. Look at verses six and seven. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The word anxious there is merimnao, and it has both positive and negative meanings. Positively, it can mean to care for others and to be rightly concerned. In 1 Corinthians 12, 25, Paul uses this term to refer to how the members of the body should have a care for one another. Or here, actually, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul talks about how he and Timothy are the only ones that Paul knows that have a concern, a good concern concern for the Philippian church. So there are many situations where it is right to have a godly concern for the welfare of others. But there is also an ungodly concern that we call worry or anxiety, and that's what Paul calls us to cease here. This anxiety and worry is what we experience when we take upon ourselves the responsibility for things which we cannot control. In Matthew 6, Jesus speaks about worrying about tomorrow, what you're going to eat and what you're going to drink and how long you're going to live. He says that's the result of not trusting the Father to provide for you. Anxiety, you could say, is the stress that we feel in our body when We pull God off His throne and put ourselves there and immediately realize we don't have the knowledge, the resources, or the power to control anything. Instead of realizing our mistake and jumping off the throne and recognizing that God alone is in control and working all things for good, we freeze and we can't stop thinking about all the things that can go wrong. We make endless false prophecies about the future. And instead of recognizing how terrible we are at predicting the future, we just keep on going. This is idolatry. We keep praying to ourselves, thinking that if we keep doing that, at some point we'll come up with the solution and control the future. The solution then is to stop praying to yourself and to start praying to God. We need to get off that throne and let God take His rightful place. Note how Paul says there in verse 6, how he refers to prayer and supplication. Those two words really are synonymous and speak of that one reality, communicating to God the burdens of our heart. So prayer and supplication speaks to the act generally. Then he refers to thanksgiving and request, which speaks to the content of our prayers. And in total, the idea is to take all of what is in your heart and lay it out before the Lord. In fact, instead of saying at the end of verse 6, be made known to God, a more literal translation is be made known in the presence of God. Prayer is how we draw near to the throne of grace that we may find help and mercy and grace in time of need, as it says in Hebrews 4.16. So what do you say to God when it feels like your world is crashing around you? Well, we're familiar with the acronym ACTS, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplication, as a way of moving through prayer. And that is a helpful way to think about prayer, but it doesn't cover everything. 
from the Scripture, we can derive other kinds of content that we can and should include when we're crying out to God in desperate times. So let me give you five categories that God's Word teaches us. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to fly through them and give you a couple passages that you can write down to look at as a model in your own time. First, show and tell. Show and tell. We can tell God what is going on, even show Him the evidence. An example of this is 2 Kings 19, when King Hezekiah took the threatening letter from Rabshakeh and spread it out before the Lord as if to say, Lord, do you see what they're saying here? You can look at Psalm 64 and Psalm 73 at how those psalmists talk to the Lord. Second, confusion. You can express your confusion to God by asking the heart-wrenching questions that are running through your mind. Psalm 13 is one of many psalms with questions like, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will my enemies be exalted over me? Third, fears. You can convey your fears and anxieties, such as we read in Psalm 38. Fourth, trust. We can declare our trust in the Lord and affirm to ourselves and to Him that He is faithful and just and powerful and full of steadfast love. Almost every prayer in the Psalms has some aspect of the character of God that no matter what else is going on, the psalmist affirms and recognizes as being true of the Lord. And then fifth, history. We can recite for God His past faithfulness and care for us. Following the example of Psalm 139, Psalm 143, and others as well. These five categories, again, are show and tell, confusion, fears, trust, and history. Sorry, there's no acronym. I worked hard and I couldn't come up with one. (laughs) And then add to these... The thanksgiving that we can give to God for the endless flow of His grace that sustains our life and the blessings that He pours out beyond number, such as in Psalm 107. No matter how difficult life gets, there's always reason to give thanks for His goodness in the past and present. And then finally, we can make requests. We can specifically ask God to act. And yes, we can ask according to our will, As long as we submit our will to His, following the example of our Lord who said, not my will, but yours be done. In expressing all that is in our heart and laying it out before the Lord, what we're doing is we're letting God take our burden. Instead of letting our problems terminate with us, we're handing them over to Him to deal with. We're acknowledging our complete dependence on Him and affirming that He alone is able to handle it. And when we do this, Paul says in verse 7, the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This peace surpasses all comprehension. Meaning, God's peace is not based on our ability to, to reason through and untangle the mess of our problems. Rather, God's peace is uh, uh, available to us even if we can't comprehend what God is up to. We can't figure out the solution. We can't wrap our mind around what God is up to. And yet, we can have peace. Why? Because we've given up on the lie that it's up to us to figure out the solution to everything. And we've bought into the truth that God is sovereign and good. This peace that surpasses all comprehension will guard our hearts and our minds. This is to say that God's peace will steady us. It will prevent our hearts and our minds from shaking and trembling at every threat. 
God's peace creates that protective layer around our minds that prevents fears and troubles from penetrating through and debilitating us. Again, I remind you of Isaiah 26, 3 and 4, the steadfast of mind you will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. So trust in the Lord forever. For in God the Lord we have an everlasting rock. Well, we've looked at three prescriptions for perilous times. In verse 4, we saw that we must let joy reign in our hearts. In verse 5, we saw that we must let gentleness, let others experience our gentleness. And here in verses 6 and 7, we saw that we must let God take our burdens. Consider the fourth prescription in verse 8. Let truth rule your mind. Let truth rule your mind. Look at verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Here, Paul makes explicit what he's already been saying. The way to respond to trouble is to fill your mind with what is true and what is beneficial. This prescription does not mean read a verse, sleep on it, and see how you feel in the morning. No, this prescription is like a five times a day physical therapy aimed at strengthening your heart and your mind. This practice follows the example of the blessed person of Psalm 1 who meditates on the Lord day and, on the law of the Lord day and night. And the result of that meditation makes him a strong tree able to withstand any storm. Dwelling on these things or meditating does not mean that we just endlessly read the Bible. It means that we take in some truth and we chew on it for a little while. And then we swallow it and do what we need to do. And then we regurgitate it and chew on it some more. Perhaps we pray about it. Perhaps we talk to other people about it. Perhaps we journal about it. In various ways, we allow the truth to rule, to run around in our mind, and by being so occupied by it, there is no more room or little room for anxious thoughts. Notice the kinds of truths we should dwell on. He says, whatever is true. Whatever is true is that which corresponds to reality from God's perspective as revealed in His Word. Truths about God, salvation, God's purposes and His promises, His plans for the future, as well as the whole mountain of truth revealed to us in Scripture. We should also dwell, he says, on what is honorable. This is closely associated with sacred things, things that are worthy of respect and dignity because they reflect the holiness of God. These are not the base things of the world, but the transcendent realities that command worship. He says, dwell on whatever is right or righteous. This could also mean just. That which aligns with justice and equity. Jesus said in John 7, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. And so rather than filling our minds with superficial judgments, we should consider God's way of assessing a situation. We should then dwell on whatever is pure. Things that are pure are things that are free from sin. They are unstained by the world. They are morally upright. Rather than filling our minds with sin-saturated content where sin is normalized and glorified, we should dwell on things that normalize God's standard of truth and justice and morality. Then he says we should dwell on whatever is lovely, that which is endearing or agreeable or pleasing. These are things that are attractive and not repulsive. When you think about them and when you speak about them, they draw people in and they don't push them away. He says we should dwell on whatever is of good repute. These are things that others consider to be commendable, and praiseworthy. When others hear about these things, they affirm them and that they are true and beneficial. 
And then, after listing those six qualities, Paul gives two broad filters that encompass all of them as well as any other kind of thought. Notice there in the middle of verse 8, he says, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise. The word excellence means moral virtues, things that reflect God's character, such as mercy and grace and love and kindness and so on. And then, of course, anything worthy of praise refers to anything that receives God's stamp of approval and which others would praise and celebrate as well. These qualities are a filter that you place around your mind to determine what thoughts should be taking up residence in your mind and what thoughts and ideas should be evicted from your mind. So is your mind troubled and filled with worry? Make a list of all kinds of things that fall under these characteristics. Think about those things. Read about those things. Listen to teaching and talk and songs and talk with others about those things. Fill your mind with truth and let it rule your mind. Finally, consider the last prescription, prescription number five, let truth rule your life. Let truth rule your life. Look at verse 9. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. The things they've learned and received and heard and seen really encompasses all of the truth that has come to them in all of its forms. They've learned the truth from their own study of Scripture. They've received the truth handed down from their parents and others. They've heard the truth from, Pat, from Paul and their pastors and teachers. And then they've seen the truth lived out by Paul and others' example. They've been exposed to the truth. They know the truth. They've seen models of what it looks like to live according to the truth. And remember how Paul said in chapter 3, verse 17, Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. So here he says the same thing. Take what you know, take what you've observed, and live it out. Put it into practice. How you live reveals what you really believe. We may say that God is good and sovereign, But we often respond to trials as if God has lost control and His character is suspect. We might say that to live is Christ and to die is gain. But then we live as though to live is gain and to die is loss. We cannot content ourselves just with with setting our mind on the truth. We have to live according to the truth, to practice these things, to live faithfully, consistently with the truth. That's how you know what you really believe. James 2.14 says, what use is it, my brethren? If someone says he has faith, but he has no works, can that faith save him? Now, he doesn't mean that it is works that saves us, but rather that saving faith is validated by our works. As it's been said, we are saved by faith, not by, excuse me, we are saved by faith alone, but not by faith that is alone. And so earlier in James chapter 1, James says, but prove yourselves to be doers of the word and not mere hearers who delude themselves. So don't be deluded into thinking that you can just hear the word and that's enough. Don't think that just being taught truth and wisdom is going to change your life. Too often people think or say, oh, I've tried that. I've tried the church. I've tried counseling. I've tried therapy. Nothing has worked. And the reality is they didn't work. They didn't put the truth into practice. They thought they could sit passively and let truth enter their ears and then go on making the same decisions and choices that put them in that situation to begin with. You know what brings change into your life and what brings peace into your soul and what draws you closer to God is daily living out the truth you've learned and received and heard and observed. 
Well, as we come to a close, the result of letting the truth rule our lives is there at the end of verse 9. He says, the God of peace will be with you. Notice that in verse 7, he says, the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. And here he says, the God of peace will be with you. Now, we know that God is always with us. Psalm 139 reminds us that God is personally present with us wherever we are. One of the greatest promises of the Bible is that Jesus will never leave us or forsake us, right? Jesus says, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So what does Paul mean here by saying that the God of peace will be with us if we practice these things? Well, I think this reality reflects, or this reflects the reality that while God is always with us, there are times when we don't sense His presence. When our minds are not filled with the truth, when our lives are unfaithful to the truth, when our vision is clouded by the troubles and the trials of life, we don't feel that nearness of God. But when we do set our minds on the truth and we do start living in faithfulness to that truth by faith, and when the Spirit helps us to walk by faith, we have a greater sense of God's presence, especially in troubled times. In Psalm 23, David said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. There's nothing more frightening or distressing or anxiety producing than walking through the valley of the shadow of death. But even in that dark valley, fear can be swept away by the knowledge of God's presence and care for us. Beloved, we live in a perilous world. I don't need to tell you that. Job and his friends didn't agree on much, but they did agree on one thing. Eliphaz said, man is born for trouble as sparks fly upward. And Job said, man who is born of woman is short-lived and full of turmoil. Whatever steps we can and should take to mitigate the dangers and threats of the physical and social and relational uh, relational and spiritual challenges around us, we can't stop trouble from breaking in and entering our lives uninvited. So what can we do when that happens? Well, there's a lot that we can do, but here are five things that we must do. Let joy reign in your heart. Let others experience your gentleness. Let God take the burdens from you. Let the truth rule your mind and let the truth rule your life. Let's pray. Our Lord, as we consider these prescriptions, we are reminded at how difficult they are, how easy it is for us to get myopic and short-sighted, nearsighted. We feel the pain of our trouble and we lose sight of all that is true. And so we just confess that these are not things we can do on our own. We can't do this by our own willpower, by our own strength, by our own intelligence. Even those who've walked with you for decades can't do this on their own. We desperately need your help. We are a troubled people. We live in sin-cursed bodies. We have the flesh that rules us so often when we let it. And then we experience the troubles of this world. Lord, forgive us for not trusting in you. Forgive us for not remembering what we know, that you are sovereign and you are good and your love never ceases and you are always with us. 
Help us, Lord, today, this week, when trouble arises, to look to you, to run to your throne of grace, to acknowledge our weakness and need so that we might find comfort and peace in your strength. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.